Uh, all right, guys, thanks for joining. Uh, so uh, this call, this call is basically about conversions on how to convert the leads. Uh, Tyler is a team leader. He's been a team leader. He has three teams, one in Florida, one in Michigan, one in Ohio. He's been in the business for about 25 years and manages a team of about 15 people. Uh, right now, uh, I don't know, on average, he, with the program that we have, he does about two listings with us a month, but I'm sure he does more transactions. The reason I wanted to bring him on the call was because the way he converts leads, the way the thought process that he goes through and the effort that he puts in is going to be beneficial for all of you guys. So that's the reason why I wanted to bring him on board. Uh, so you guys can listen and see how he does it and take away a few key things from uh, from this conversation. So, Tyler, before we begin, uh, do you want to bring something up uh, before we start, before I start the process? Sure. So I'll just give you a quick introduction. Um, when I started as a realtor, I think my first year I did 60 transactions. Truth be told, a lot of that was Zillow based. Um, at some point I had to transition out of Zillow because it became super expensive, uh, as far as like my cost per lead, especially as my group grew. So year one, I did 60 transactions year two, I think a hundred year three, it was one Oh three. But as I started to expand that cost per lead made it difficult, um, to keep doing what I was doing. So then that led me on kind of an evolution to find lead sources that weren't 300 bucks, 400 bucks a lead, right? And now I think with the current environment we're in where there's a lot of questions as far as buyers, agents, uh, and where that's gonna go, it's leading me to another evolution, which is, all right, where do I find seller specific leads? And where do I find seller specific leads at a decent price point to where I can take some, but I can also refer those out to my group and still make money. And I think through that evolution, it kind of led me to you. And we've been working together now for a few months. And um, I think YSM makes it perfect for that agent that is going to be forced to trans transition into a more seller-based model. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that uh, that that makes sense. So what uh, well, today's agenda, just so you guys know, I have a set a bunch of questions. Uh, for Tyler. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, all the questions that I have in place. And these are based on all the questions that I get from you guys and from uh, every other realtor or mortgage broker that I talk to. So I'm going to ask these questions. And then at the end, we'll have about 20 minutes of Q&A. Uh, you can put your questions in the chat and we'll ask those questions as we go. Um, and then I'll answer them for you as we go. Right. So uh, Tyler will answer them as we go. So let's just get into it. So the first question, Tyler, uh, before, uh, like just walk us through what is your process, uh, on converting, uh, like a lead that comes from online or from like text campaign or from cold calling, like what is your process, uh, when a new lead you get or your team gets, what do you, what's your starting process from there? Sure. So that starting process, I think everybody, when they start a hundred percent, you have to have a CRM, right? And Everybody always says the best CRM you use is the, the one that you're going to use. So um, I've used a couple of different CRMs. The one I've settled on is Follow-Up Boss. So the second that lead comes in, um, either I'm calling that lead myself, if I'm in an appointment or if I'm doing something, I text that lead to two of my agents. So that lead is getting sent to somebody ASAP, okay? The other thing that happens is the second that lead hits my database, it goes into a pond where any of my agents can call. The other thing that happens is um, I used to use Conversion Monster, but now I use Callingly. And you can dial Callingly in for however you want it. So that lead comes in, hits my database. Within five seconds, Callingly is calling the agents in my system. The first agent to pick that lead up basically gets a transfer. Now, that transfer might happen like mid-call, and it does most of the time. And we found out that we're getting about a 10% answer rate. So the agent's answering that, and there is about a 10% answer rate. But the other thing that we found, too, is um, we're using a company called Lead Engage, and we hired a company called KTS to make uh, custom-specific drips for us. 
So those drips are automatically being put on that lead. All of this happens within seconds of a lead going into my database. So they're getting called, they're getting text. All of these things are happening within seconds, right? The next thing that happens is when I get in front of my computer, we are emailing that client a home valuation. And I'll tell you what, it's shocking. Everybody says email's dead, but with Follow Boss, I can actually see when they open up the email, how many times they open up the email. Um, they're looking at their email. They 100% are sometimes not answering your call or your text, but they 100% are looking at that email and I can see where they open up that property valuation three, four times. The other thing that's really interesting is after I email it to them, I send them a text, hey, I just emailed this valuation to you. What are your thoughts? And I'm just trying to like engage them and open up that conversation. The next thing I do is I'm actually mailing them. Um, you know, if, if you guys can see this at home, I use RPR and I will actually mail it to their house. All right. And I'm actually getting one to two people calling me based off of the physical mail that's sent out. So I'm getting oh, one or two listings a month based on the mail that I'm sending them, even though that valuation is the same one I sent it to them in the email. Um, so, I mean, I'm hitting them calls, texts, emails, regular mail. That's yeah. what happens the second a lead hits my system. So um, so I know you call the leads as soon as possible. Like, what's your call sequence like? Like, one is ASAP as soon as you get them. And then what's your call sequence after that? What does that look sure. like? Or so I think that that was something I had to learn the hard way, right? Because the seller mentality is not necessarily that same mentality as a buyer that's coming in through Zillow, right? So that buyer that's coming in through Zillow, like you need to get them in that house now. You need to meet them. Otherwise, they're clicking a button and you're out, right? And they have a new realtor. That seller mentality is a little different. Um, now, there are times, like this morning before I started this call, I actually went and signed up a YSM sales lead. So we go live a week from Friday and from start to finish, that was like three days from when that lead came in to when I called them, set, set the appointment up. Um, but they don't all work that way. I think, you know, some of these people are kicking the tires. Some of the people, maybe they want to get evaluation. They want to maybe get their house ready and sell in a month, in three months. So that's where we've adopted that sales cycle. So I'll hit them immediately when that lead comes in because there are people that do want to sell right now. But, you know, there's 80 or 90% of the people that it's more of a long play, right? So when that lead comes in, I'll put a follow-up on that person for, you know, a day, a week, a month, three months, six months. And in the background, callingly will automatically call that person on the second it comes in. It'll call them four hours later. It'll call them three days later, and it'll call them a week later. So I have all these automated sequences in. And I think the last time I looked, we were getting a hold of 40 or 45% of the YSM leads that were coming into our system. Yeah, okay, that's good. That's good to know. Uh, and then the question that I had for you is, so uh, how, what's the touch point like? So uh, how many times do you guys touch the lead like how many times the calling sequence, the touch point, email touch point and text touch point, what does that look like on average? So with that automated drip that we have through Lead Engage and KTS, I think that's 18 touch points with text and emails, okay? And then callingly is set up for three or four um, automated calls. And then for my in-house ISAs, I have it set up to call immediately, the next day, the next week, the next month, three months, and six months. So, I mean, honestly, altogether, there's probably 30 some touch points. Now, I think the thing that's also really important with all of that is uh, once a week, I send all my seller leads to HomeBot. And HomeBot, for you guys that aren't using it, it's pretty cheap. And it will send these people automated valuations for, you know, if their house goes up in value, down in value, what they could rent the house for, what they could Airbnb it. So it's nice for the consumer because it's free for them, but it's really nice for me because I can see their activity. And anytime you can call somebody and create some value with that call, I think there's value in that, you know, so that you're not just calling somebody and saying, hey, do you want to buy a house? Do you want to sell a house? I'm able to now call with intent and purpose. You know what I mean? And then I'm also, I use Breakthrough Broker. It's like 12 bucks a month, but they have um, 
templates already done, right? So that way I can change it up with some of the physical mailings that I do with them that I send them in the mail. And I can see if somebody's engaged by what, if they're coming through on HomeBot. Got it. And then uh, I know a lot of people uh, like uh, kind of frown upon on just sending the home evaluation without talking to the uh, the seller. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Like, I know you just send. Yeah, you... I, dis I disagree with that 100%. So there's a lot of these people that I'm not talking to, right? Either they're not taking the phone call, they're not taking and answering the text. I can see they open the email, but they're not responding to that either. So I think it's important, at least for me, everybody responds in their own manner, right? And some people are more comfortable responding through email. Some people are more comfortable texting. Some people want a phone call. But there are some people, you know what I mean, that are still responding via mail. So for me personally, like, that's just part of my routine. Like, I'm emailing them that home valuation, and I'm sending it to them physically in the mail, whether I get a hold of them or not. Yeah, and then how many times do you get do you mail uh, the the physical stuff? Like, uh, how often? And what does that process look like? Um, so, you know, right, especially in the beginning, right? So, like that first piece that comes out, I'm sending on that home valuation, right? And then the second piece that I send out is, I actually made a, a three page binder, right? That kind of goes over what it's like to sell a house right so i mean it cost me a little bit of money to put something like this together and then you know cost me a dollar 86 to mail it but every decent lead i have they're getting something like this too with my business card on it and then i'm also taking and depending on where they're at in the process you know i have custom made postcards and i have big postcards right so uh, i'm doing all these things they're getting all these things within a couple months and I'll tell you, the other thing it does is it's almost like a billboard that I don't have to pay for, right? Like I'm sending all of this stuff out. And now when I call, like they may not know me, they may not have ever met me, but I'm not some dude that may or may not be real, right? They've seen some of my marketing material. Um, now when I call, like they can just, they can put a voice with the picture, with the face. So it's been my experience. If I can keep that up over a couple months, it's not as cold of a call. Got it. And then uh, is there, do you guys, do you, uh, when do you guys give up on the leads? Like what does that process look like? Yes, I don't give up. I don't give up on leads until, until they tell me to F off. And even then they're, you know, they're really just telling me to F off for that day. You know what I mean? Um, so I closed a Y Lopo lead. It was a $14,000 commission. And I, it was in our system for over two years. We closed that last week. Um, I have a Z buyer lead, which everybody says that those are no good. Guess what? I mean, that's been in our system for nine months and, uh, we're closing that next week and that's a, a $9,000 commission. So, you know, I mean, cradle to grave is what I do. You know what I mean? And I think all too often people's, you know, some lady says, I'm not interested. And then you trash the lead and it's over. Right. So if in that case, like I may just put that person in for a follow-up in like a month, you know what I mean? Or like three months, right? Because the reality of it is they took the time to put their information in, you know what I mean? They took the time to, you know, give their address and their phone number. So there, there has to be some interest in some way, shape or form. Otherwise people don't do that. But maybe you call them when they were at their kid's soccer game, you know what I mean? And hey, you know what? Or how about maybe they got bombarded with 10 phone calls, you know what I mean? And we all know Agents make one or two calls and then they're not doing anything anymore. So if I'm the guy that's calling three months later, I'm the guy getting the business. Yeah, hundred percent. And then, uh, do you, uh, 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 let's say like the uh, a buyer or a seller, for example, picks up a phone and, and, or your team member picks up the phone and they have a conversation. What is usually, uh, what are the openers that you guys use? How do you guys open the conversation uh, without being intrusive? Uh, and then also, what does that conversation look like in general? Like it doesn't need right. to be a script, but just having an idea on what what that looks like. That that's also helpful. So, I think that we we learn the hard way on that. So, you know, I think what's can you hear me? yeah. Okay. Still here. Okay. 
So I think we learned the hard way on that. So I think in the beginning. Uh, I think you went on mute, Tyler. Uh, you might have on mute. Can you okay. hear me now? Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. So I think we learned the hard way on that, right? So I think in the beginning, a lead would come in and we were more like, hey, you know, are you guys looking to sell your house or, and it was really too aggressive for people. So what we've changed is we're saying, hey, you know, and we see that you're looking for evaluation on your house and you're going to have that before the end of the day. However, what is prompting you to ask for this valuation? You know what I mean? So we're trying to get to the root of, you know, why are they looking for that valuation? So we're really just trying to have a conversation with them first and letting them know, hey, you're going to get this valuation. You know what I mean? However, you know what I mean? Where are you at in this process? Like, you know, why are you looking for this valuation? And once we can uncover those things, I can have a much better conversation with some of those people. So I think we're not coming in so hot. I'm really trying to figure out what their motivation is for wanting the price or the value on that house. And from there, it's just a normal conversation. You know, I don't know if you guys have ever read uh, that book, Too Nice for Sales by Barry Jenkins, but, you know, Barry took and, you know, Barry sells 750 houses a year, maybe even more than that. But he spent an hour with me one day and he's like, Tyler, man, you're, you're too aggressive. You know what I mean? Make a friend with these people. And then you can kind of go into, you know, how you can best help them. So it was really good advice. And I've, I've kind of taken that as I've gone along with this. Got it. Um, that that makes sense. So like providing value first and just having a conversation, see where they are, where they want to be. Um, that's that's the number one thing. So I understand. Uh, in terms of qualification, um, like I know you have, uh, do you have a specific qualification process you guys follow internally uh, when you do get the leads over the phone? So the only thing that we're trying to do is make a friend, right? And it's, uh, if you guys have ever read Straight Line Selling by the Wolf of Wall Street, uh, it's a great book, right? And we kind of adhere to that where you're trying to bump people down those kind of like dotted lines. And if they start talking about their hunting trip or they start talking about something else, you try to get them back on that line. So we kind of prescribe to that. And along that line, I'm trying to uncover their motive, right? And mm -hmm. our end goal is to try to get a meeting in that house, right? Because if I can get a meeting in that house, I can establish rapport, right? And I know if I can meet them face-to-face -face and if I can get the rapport, there's a good chance I'm going to keep them as a client, whether or not they're wanting to buy now or in a month, right? So that's the end goal is to build that sort of trust, to sort of build that rapport and, you know, get in that living room and introduce myself and find out exactly, you know, what they want to accomplish or what it is that they need. Got it. Okay. No, that makes sense. In terms of like uh, transitioning from having a conversation to booking an in-person appointment, what does that transition look like on your end? Like, um, uh, do you guys just, uh, after having quali uh, qualification, qualifying them, do you guys just go straight into, hey, when can I stop by uh, to check out the property? Or what, what does that look like? Just so I have an idea. So the transition goes, you know, I, I can give you a CMA. A lot of that CMA is based on a computer generated model. But the reality of it is that computer or even Zillow has never been inside your house. You know, so what I'm going to be able to do is give you a ballpark. And that ballpark can range very heavy from the left to the right as far as price. Like if you want me to give you an accurate valuation on your house, I really need to take a look at it. And that's kind of where it goes. And that's that's where I start taking the temperature of exactly where they're at with everything. Got it. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, and now, now let's transition into like, say you talk to the seller, the seller has some objections couple of top objections that most people get is like, oh, I, I already have a realtor. Like what what uh what do you what do you do in the, those scenarios? So I, I tell those people, you know, there's 2,800 realtors in my city where I live. So most of the people I deal with already have a realtor, cousins a realtor, you know, and then I go back to telling them like, hey, you know what, there's a lot of people I deal with that they don't really want to deal with family. 
And then I also ask them if their current realtor has gone over their commission structure and also their marketing plan. And I, I try to create that little bit of doubt. Um, we actually have a YSM lead that's closing next week. And the guy said he was using his cousin as a realtor. We asked him if he his cousin had gone over his commission plan. The and cousin said, uh, no. He then talked to the cousin. Using your touch cousin, Please press cousin told him his commission was 7%. I was like, all right, let me in the door. Let me show you what I can do and how I can do it. We'll do it for 5%. And we're actually closing that deal next week. So everybody knows a realtor, right? And what I want to do is just create that smidgen of doubt that, hey, do they have as good a marketing plan as I have? You know, what's their commission structure? And I just, you know, I, I need a, a door to open slightly, you know what I mean? Then I might have a shot to that business. I think 99% of the people just say, that's great, you have a realtor, and thanks for your time, and hang up, and and that's that. I mean, we've even found out in some cases, these people are telling us they have a realtor, and they're just saying that because they don't want to be bothered anymore. You know, I, I teach my agents all the time, you know, you ever go to a car dealership on a Sunday? You know, mm -hmm. there's no salespeople there, but there's cars circling all over the parking lot, right? So yeah. these people are in the market to buy a car, but they're not ready to talk to a sales rep, right? And that's what some of these people are too, right? Like maybe they want to know what their house is worth, but they're not ready to sell. And I want them to know that's okay. You know what I mean? Whatever you need, I can help you with. But I want to be the guy that when they get down that funnel, that I can help them with that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, in terms of like the, some common objections, that was one one of them. Uh, the next one is like, hey, I want XXX dollars for my house, right? Let's say the property is worth 500. They want like 700K or 600K for the house. Well, how do you handle those type of objections? So I write that. So it depends on how far off they are. Like I don't want to get laughed at for listing a house that I'll never sell. But mm -hmm. for me personally, what I'll do is if it's at least in the ballpark, I'll say, you know what? Let's try it your way for two weeks. And then I'll have it written on the listing agreement on a specific date that we're dropping the price, you know, to this point, right? And maybe I have to even do that two or three times on that purchase agreement, but I'm writing the dates and the price drop and I'm having them initial it next to it. And then, you know what? Everybody wins. Because in my market, if, you know, somebody will tell them, yeah, I'll take the listing and I'll list it for that, right? And then I'm watching it in an MLS and I'm getting pissed as they're doing price drops. And then it finally sells to where I said it was going to sell. So now I'm like, F it. I'm not going to lose to these guys. You know what I mean? Just telling them what they want to hear. I'm not going to lose my integrity over it, but I'll tell them, you know what? We'll try it your way. But at, you know, after two weeks, after a month, like this is what our game plan needs to be. Yeah. Okay. No, that, that, that makes sense. That's a good idea uh, to add that into the contract. Uh, let's say somebody's like, hey, I want to, I want to pay only like, like a lot of physicals will give this objection. I want to pay only like 3% commission or like, or I want to pay like 4% commission, something like that along those lines. What do you do in those scenarios? I tell them, you know, let's sit down, let's go over my marketing plan. And maybe there's things that don't work for you. And I have a plan that'll work for everybody. You know, if you don't want to pay the full commission, maybe there's some things we can take out of my proposal to you. And maybe I can get it to a level that works. Like, let's sit down and let's see exactly what you're looking for. Yeah. Okay. So you give them options. Uh, now, I know there are a lot of realtors in general in all, all states, but not not everybody's like usually the best, right? Like the, everybody has like a different way of doing things. How do you separate yourself compared to like, say, 10 other realtors that might be trying, want, wanting to get into the same property? Uh, do you, what, what do you, how do you go about that type of a conversation? I think if you guys aren't using a spot to house your reviews, you probably should do that like immediately. So when I first started, I used all my reviews on Zillow. And then I think after I had 200, some of them, I thought, crap, like if something happens with Zillow, all my reviews are, are with Zillow. So I started housing some of my reviews on uh, my Google uh, business page, right? So what I tell those people is, you know, listen, Look at my reviews. You can actually look. I have over 278 five-star reviews. You can read the reviews. You know, my my goal is to get another review from you and also a referral from somebody that you know. You know, selling you a house or selling you your house is not my end goal. You know, my end goal is giving you a great experience. 
And I think as soon as people understand that, like, I'm not in it to get their money specifically, like I'm in it to help them, that there's value there. Got it. Makes sense. Uh, in terms of uh, structuring your day, like, what does that look like? Like, how do you structure your day? Because as a realtor, it gets super busy. Like I know, and you're running a team, but if it's a solo agent or somebody who's not running a team, how would they structure their day? What should that look like? How much time should they put towards like prospecting, reaching out to folks compared to just like showing how like stuff like that? Like what is, what does that look like on your end? I have this conversation on a daily basis with uh, the agents that I work with. Right. Because what happens is their business runs them, you know, like, you get 10 deals under contract and you're running around crazy and you're negotiating and you're working inspection and appraisal and talking to title and talking to the lender. You know, what really needs to happen is you have to take and time block time to prospect, right? If you don't, your business is going to be very up and down. You know what I mean? So I tell them all the time, if you're not putting time in to prospect and call the leads and actually putting that in your calendar, like it's a regular appointment, your business will run you, you know? And I think the reality of it is if you want a well-rounded business, like, yeah, I'm not saying you don't have to do those things because you do. But if you also don't put that in your calendar, like you're you're going to have a problem, right? Like you're going to have 10 deals on your contract. You're going to sell those 10 and then that scoreboard's going to say zero and then you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so in terms of like, uh, how do you reverse engineer your team's goals or like a realtor's goal? Let's say you get a new realtor on the team. They want to hit 200K, 300K in GCI, whatever that looks like. How do you usually reverse engineer their goals to make that number at the end of the year? Usually. At the end of the day, it's math, right? So I'm looking and, you know, that agent's telling me what he wants to make, right? We're looking at what the average sale is. If I get the average sale, I can see basically what their average commission is going to be. At that point, we can boil it down to, all right, you need to sell four houses a month. All right. How are we going to sell four houses a month? Right. And we know, all right, uh, if you're closing percentage, because I can tell how many leads they take into their database. If they have 100 leads in the database and they close five, I can tell them pretty quick. All right. Like if you need to sell 20 houses, you need to have... 400 people in the database or whatever it is. So for me, everything is based off of how many leads they have in the system and what their closing percentage is. And then at that point, simple math, because I know right now, you know, 10% of the leads will call a number from an agent or a number that they don't know. So you have to make 10 calls to get one person to answer, right? The numbers tell us 20 to 30% will maybe respond to a text, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, they know off the bat, they have to call and they have to text. And then we have to figure out how many conversations, whether it's text or calling, does it take for that person to become a client, right? And that's how we reverse engineer everything. Like it's just, it's pure math, right? Like the bigger the database, the more yield you're going to get out of that database if you keep up on it. Got it, okay, no, it makes sense. Uh, that's super helpful. In terms of, uh, uh, I was going to ask you, in terms of uh, like lead sources, right? I know you've done it all, everything under the sun uh, from using my services to other companies and stuff like that. Uh, what are some of like, does lead, first question is, does lead source even matter? That's number one. Uh, number two is like, if it does matter, like what are some of the top 10 lead sources for most realtors? You know, or you can start with top five. That's fine too. Sure. So lead source 100% matters, right? And I'll tell you every six months, you know, I go through and I look at all of my lead sources and look at the yield, you know, and I'll say, you know, I use HomeLight, but you're paying a 35% referral on HomeLight, right? So where I'm paying $20 a lead for you, you know, that lead I close in HomeLight could cost me two Gs, right? Um, I use Clever, right? And Clever is a good source for, for listings, uh, but I'm taking a discounted listing, you know what I mean? And I'm paying a referral fee. Um, I use Ylopo, right? Uh, Ylopo is good. I think we closed 24 deals as a team last year through Ylopo. 
Now, it's interesting when you look at the return, you know, because if I look at when that lead was created, if I'm looking at my local from like a six month um, point of view, it's not a great return. If I go back and look at leads that were created 18 months or less, it's a much better return. So, you know, that tells us like all these lead sources aren't the same, like a Zillow and a realtor, like those people might be ready to go right now. You know what I mean? That Y local lead source, those people might be ready to go in six months. You know what I mean? Um, we use Z buyer. It's another source of uh, inexpensive seller leads. And I could tell you, you know, my agents bitched and moaned at Z buyer, right? Cause they're like, dude, these guys just want cash offers for their house. Well, dude, I actually bought two Z buyer houses myself last year, turned them around and made like 30 G's each. You know what I mean? On those houses. And when we looked at our return on investment over the last year and a half with Z buyer, we were like a two to one return, but we had to speak to them differently. You know what I mean? Those people were looking for a cash offer on their house. So when I could get an appointment and I met with them and I showed them somebody that's going to give you a cash offer on your house is looking for a heavy discount because they want to put their money to work. This is what it looks like for a cash offer. This is what it looks like if you auction the house, right? Because we actually ended up auctioning a couple of those last year. And then this is what it looks like if I list the house, right? So we give them all three options, but we have to speak their language, right? Same thing when I talk to a Y local lead, like we have to speak their language because those people are a combination of Facebook and Google leads, right? So they may not be ready to buy today. And we have to recognize those people need to be talked to differently. You know what I mean? We need to set them up on a search. We need to check in with them, you know, every month or every quarter, depending on where they're at and, and what they have. So, you know, I mean, I, I use a lot of lead sources. I, I try them all, you know, and I'm evaluating every lead source every six months. Yeah. And uh, you feel like it's more of like uh, all of the systems working together for you, right? Rather than just one system at a time. Uh, like you take the lead through different channels to get in front of them. And then once you get in front of them, then the process is pretty simple, right? Like it doesn't, it doesn't, and then you speak their language, basically. That's, that's the, that's the key thing that you focus on after that. I mean, we just have to talk to them, you know what I mean? And find out, you know, we make it about them. What is your motivation for buying and selling? What is your timeline? So, you know, I'm trying to figure out what makes them tick and not just saying, hey, are you ready to buy or sell a house? Like I'm trying to learn more about them because once I find out what their situation is, I can better help them. Got it. Makes sense. Uh, anything else you'd like to share uh, on lead conversion with these agents like that can help them, uh, whether it's mindset, music, like whatever that looks like. What, what are some like, let's say, top five things you do uh, or that you can share with the agents that can help them on improving their conversion rates? So, I, you know, for me, like prospecting is a mindset. You know, I think nobody likes to sit down for two or three hours or whatever it is and prospect. Uh, for me, like I get in a good place, right? Like I get in my pajamas, I put Led Zeppelin on, you know what I mean? And um, Wolf of Wall Street, like if you read that book, Straight Line Selling, he used anchoring. Right. So he suggested this thing called a boom, boom stick, which is like a scented snick or a scented stick that you can sniff like a Vicks stick. I went and bought a couple of boom, boom sticks. Right. And it puts me in a good frame of mind. You know what I mean? To crank through these. So I prescribe to all that. You know what I mean? I put myself in a good frame of mind. I understand that at that time I'm a garbage picker. Right. And I'm a garbage picker that makes a lot of money. But I also realize I'm working in very small percentages, right? Like it sounds crazy, but you know, in baseball, a guy that bats 200 is out of baseball, right? A guy that bats 300 is in the All Star game, right? Um, yeah. I remember I worked for Pella Windows and Doors, right? And they took us to Pella, Iowa, and they said, "Guess what? If you close at 33 percent, you're replaceable, and we're going to fire you." because anybody will close at 33% because of the Pella name. If you close at 39%, we're flying you someplace for an award. And I thought, holy crap, you know what I mean? Like 6% yeah. is the difference between getting fired and like getting all sorts of national recognition. But I think it's relevant in real estate, right? Because, you know, 
where you know you're talking with a Facebook lead, the national conversion is one or two percent. A uh, Google lead is converting at you know probably three or four percent. I think the national average for a Zillow or Realty Realtor lead is to convert at six or seven percent. You're you're dealing at very small percentages, right? If I can go from one to two percent on my Facebook conversion, I'm doubling my business, right? I mean, yeah, it doesn't like, sound like a lot, but it's a lot of money if you can double your business in that facet, right? Yeah, so that's I, that's how I'm looking at it, right? Like if I sit down and I'm going through my stack of people to call, like my goal is to try in one way, shape or form to get an appointment in somebody's living room. Yeah. And if I do that, it's a good day, right? Because if if I can get in somebody's living room, there's a good chance I'm going to sell them at some point. Yeah, I agree. Do you have uh, tracking sheets that you use as well? Uh, uh, or tracking, uh, how do you track stuff? Like that's the number one thing. I feel like a lot every business owner, including all real estate agents, need to track stuff in terms of like how many leads they get, how many calls they make, how many appointments they get, and how, out of those, how many convert, right? Like having that tracking data gives a better overview rather than just, hey, I got 100 leads and all of them sucked. Right, so that's the you. that's the best part of for me about using follow up boss right within right. seconds i can filter any sort of data i want i can filter how many zillow leads i've had in the last month how many zillow leads i've had in the last six months i can look and see how many ysm leads i've had in the last three months i can look at how many are pending how many are closed i can have all of that data within seconds right so and that's you know really kind of what i'm looking at every six months i'm looking at all right What's our close ratio? What have I spent? You know, what's our commissions? And I can get most of that pretty quickly on follow up boss. Nice. Awesome. That's good. Um, so I'll open up room for Q&A, guys. Uh, put your question in the chat. Uh, but before you do that, put a one in the chat if you liked uh, Tyler's approach and I hope uh, you found this helpful. So first do that. If you liked it, put one in the chat. That's awesome. We're getting a lot of ones. Ones, ones, ones. Awesome. Awesome. Guys, and I think it's a, it's important, right? Like I'm like you guys, you know what I mean? I'm, I don't work for YSM. I'm a, I'm a penguin on the street. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm hustling. Like I do refer stuff to my agents, but I'm also running stuff. Like I'm in the trenches, right? Like you guys, right? Now, maybe the difference is, you know, I'm like a little obsessed. You know what I mean? If I go to the gym, I'm listening to real estate podcasts. I go to like three real estate conventions a year, you know what I mean? Where I'm listening to people that are smarter than me, but I'm also, you know, applying that to my R and D department, which is rip off and duplicate, right? Like I'm taking the stuff that I like and incorporating it into my business plan. So, yeah. you know, that's awesome. No, that's great. Uh, so I, I think we have a few questions coming in. Uh, Natasha, if you can type your questions, that'd be great. Uh, the first question is from Gary Cox. Uh, so his question is: Your CMA is just a, a simple two pager? Is that is that what it is? When I mail it to him, yes. When I email it to him, I email him the whole thing, which is like fifty six pages. Fifty six pages. Got it. Okay. Um, any other questions, guys? Uh, Natasha, you have questions. Uh, anybody else questions? Do you worry, uh, so Julie asks, do you worry about the emails that go to spam? So keep in mind, that's also why I text them after I send that. So that, you know, and I do get quite a few responses back. Hey, I didn't get it. Then I can tell them, you know, hey, check your spam folder. But keep in mind, for some of those people also, that's why I'm also mailing it to them as well. So they're going to get it one way or another. Okay. No, that's awesome. Also, Julie, there's a new changes that uh, 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 Google has made for mass emailing. I'm going to send that to everybody in an email. Uh, so you guys have that information and you can make those changes or you can hire somebody. It takes about 10, 15 minutes to make those changes. So it automatically, uh, uh, automatically removes you from spam. So this is a recent change happened just today. Uh, so I'll send that over to you guys. Uh, Liz asks for the RPR mailer, uh, mailers, which two pages do you send? I sent them the picture of the front of their house. And then I sent them the send the second picture that has the valuation and also the range. Got it. Okay, cool. Uh, now keep Paul, in mind, there's a lot of people that will actually 
um, send that uh, Zestimate to them also, right? And believe it or not, there are some people that like sending the Zestimate better than say like RPR because they know the Zestimate value is gonna be way further off than RPR. And some of those people are figuring that that's gonna lead to a better conversation. Got it. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. Uh, Paul, uh, you should, uh, I think the new leads should have email, so we will send that to you. Don't worry about that. Uh, Victor has a couple of questions. Uh, which company do you use uh, for mailers to automate direct mailing? Um, so, yep. So I don't do uh, any companies for direct mailing. I, okay. I do all that myself. But I, the reason I do it is I like to control it. You know what I mean? And I'm basing some of those mailings based on what that potential client's activities are, you know, which I'm monitoring through HomeBot and on my CRM. Okay. So if they click on it or if they're like checking on it uh, and you can see that activity and that's when you send the mailers, is that what you, is that what Correct. you're doing? Okay. Yep. So instead of like sending it to everybody, uh, he just sends it to people that basically connect with HomeBot. Uh, they check their emails and stuff like that. So that, that's, that's his approach. Uh, also, he uh, Victor asks, what is the expected life cycle of Google leads and estimated uh, number of leads per deal? Um, that's what yeah. you've seen on your end. So life cycle, I think, is tough. You know what I mean? So I think, you know, that goes into, you know, the, the national average for a Facebook lead, I think they say is six to 12 months. National average for a Google lead is three to six months. My personal data tells me that actually gets extended another six months. So if I get a lead off of Google, that lifespan of trying to get that thing to the closing table is really six to 12 months. A Facebook lead is really 12 to 18 months. Um, okay. So okay. that's that's where I'm thinking, like, you know, it's taking us longer to get those types of leads to the closing table. Yeah. Yeah. Google leads does do take sometimes take a little bit longer, but it does... I've seen uh I've seen move faster when we've set it up for our clients. Like I've seen like you close a couple of deals. I've seen uh Julie is in here as well. She's closed three or four deals within six months using Google ads that we've done for her. So yeah, uh, and don't get me wrong. So I think, you know, with you, we've had we've had a lot of deals that we've closed within 30 days. You know what I mean? But I'm talking yeah. on a whole, you know what I mean? If we're looking at this thing yeah. as a, a universe, you know what I mean? And not those people just looking to buy right now, like on a whole. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's also the way people set up the ads too, so it makes a big difference as well. Uh, Natasha asks, uh, are your agents uh, making the calls? Do you have an ISA making the calls? Uh, what does that look like on your end? Yep, so keep in mind, um, I used to use Conversion Monster, but Conversion Monster was kind of pricey. So we switched to Callingly. So the second that lead comes in, Callingly will call all of the agents and then we have it set up on an automated queue where those agents are picking that call up you know what i mean at least four times throughout that first week so the agents are making the calls basically through callingly uh and then i do have an isa the isa is the one that's picking up that cadence that we set for our follow-up task that one day one week one month three months six months so we're working it both ways got it and then uh, uh, this ISA, you have one ISA for all your agents or do you have multiple ISAs? I have one in-house ISA. In-house. And are they local US-based or are they uh, out of country? What does that look like? I, I tried to have a couple ISAs from the Philippines because um, obviously it's, you know, way cheaper. I think you can get an ISA in the Philippines for five or six bucks an hour, but for me personally, it just didn't work. You know what I mean? I think um, having an in-house ISA that I pay 15 bucks an hour to, for me, was better than having a couple of out-of-country of, uh, out ISAs. Just That's just me personally. I know other people prescribe to it the other way, but having somebody in-house that I can talk to that literally can walk the phone right over to an agent, there just was more value in that for me. Got it. Um, who is, uh, also, uh, Natasha had one more question. Who, who is preparing the RPR home values is you, you said you do that personally. Uh, yeah. And RPR is just one of the services to do an automated CMA. So, you know, I, I usually type it in. It takes two seconds. RPR spits it back and that gives me material to either email to them or mail to them. 
Got it. Uh, Bill, Billy asks, uh, I transitioned into real estate from a corporate sales role, really enjoying it, closed one buyer transaction within six months. How can I gain credibility just starting out and get some listings? So, you know, joining a, a team or a group might help with that, in my opinion, because I feel like, you know, then you're not just talking about your specific accomplishments. You could go into somebody's house and say, my group sells, you know, 500 houses a year, you know what I mean? So that may be a, a good way to start if you're brand new. Now, I'll tell you, for me, when I was brand new, because I transitioned out of a corporation too, um, I think of all the times that I met with people. Now, I'm I'm a guy that likes to prepare for my meetings, you know what I mean? So I'll have all the data when I go into somebody's living room. And very few times did somebody ask me how long I've been doing real estate because I was prepared and I don't think it came across that I was a rookie. So, you know, it may not be as big of a problem as you think if you have a good listing presentation. I think if you go there all disheveled, like they may ask, like, how long have you been doing this? Like I have a specific listing presentation. I take them right through the binder. And then I actually do a, a second listing presentation specifically for their house, right? Um, and I, I think very few people will question it if you come come across that way. Yeah. Also, Billy, in terms of uh, building credibility, um, just having your Google uh, account, stuff like that, set up Google My Business with uh, some friends and family reviews, that, that can also help you too. Uh, but most people having a good presentation, go there and just be honest too. Sometimes you don't want to like lie about it as well. Uh, you just want to be uh, upfront, straightforward with it uh, if, so that they know. But I think that it doesn't, I've seen people close listings um, without having much credibility too. It does get harder, but you have to, you have to start somewhere, right? You have to start somewhere. And if you have lead generation going on and if you're getting ton of leads, uh, that can make a, a big difference as well to your business, just in general, right? So, um, for uh, Liz asks for RPR mail mailers, you send the intro page and the cover page as well, right? That's yeah, that's yeah but I just make it simple. It's two pages. Uh, Gary, I think RPR is a service. Uh, that's what it is. Uh, all the integration questions, uh, yes, we can help you put that directly into your CRM. No problem there. Uh, let me ask. Uh, let's see. What is the frequency of your follow-up? Uh, I think he answered that, but yeah, Tyler, if you can go over that one more time. Uh, so that the but, Yeah, so we, we found, you know, like you said, there are some people that want to sell right now, and that's great. And that's also why we try to do speed delete. So that's why... You know, like for my calling lead, that's set up to call within five seconds. You know what I mean? So somebody's getting a call within five seconds. If they don't answer, they're calling four hours later. If they don't answer, it's three days later. And then I think we have it set up for a week. And then um, what we have for the internal ISA is she also is calling. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Right when that lead comes in. And yeah. then she's calling the next day, the next week, the next month, three months, and six months. Because you know, we're finding that seller cycle is, in a lot of cases, way longer than like that buyer cycle. So that's where we just kind of adopted that some of these people that are inquiring, they're not really ready to sell this second. And then they get freaked out when they get 100 phone calls. And that's why we're staying on them, because some of those same people, like they're going to list in three months. And if we don't stay on them even though they've tuned us out and maybe that first day or that first week there's still business there okay no makes sense that that's that's super helpful uh guys any other questions uh for tyler uh that you guys want answers for on the conversion side uh she's gonna don't use that i use auto response uh but it has to put responses on dnd &D. So don't use that. Uh, Julie, he uses, uh, he has follow boss. So all of his lead sources go into follow boss. Uh, so it's up to him uh, on how he uses. Uh, he doesn't use high level too much because he wants everything in one place. It doesn't mean high level doesn't work. It's just he uses everything in one place. Uh, and he likes follow boss for that. And reporting is pretty good on follow boss too. Uh, 
are you manually moving no he's not man uh, well he's not manually moving uh we can automate that process from why assembly is going to follow bus so no problem there uh reach out to support they'll help you set that up any integration stuff reach out to support they'll help you set that up um any uh billy asked question any ideas on focusing ni on niches like divorces or lifestyle segment like golf communities have you seen uh, niching down as uh important in real estate or is it okay if you target broad and just go from there so we've tinkered around uh probably within the last week or last two weeks with some facebook stuff as far as like downsizing ads and mm -hmm. uh you know, we're, we're getting a lot of responses with that. But I think that that's, you know, where um, Facebook can kind of come in handy as you can really dial down on some of that stuff. So I personally haven't gone that route quite yet. You know what I mean? But, um, you know, I also have like 15 mouths to feed. So I'm, I'm more yeah. of a, you know, like the pirates in the old days, I think they used a blunderbuss where they would just cram like glass and rocks and shoot whatever they could shoot out of it you know what i mean so i'm more of a uh i guess a big shooter than a, a, a specified shooter just because i need volume i agree uh question this is question from my end um do you um I, I completely lost track of it last year when 2023 you know how markets have been going up and down uh over the past couple of years uh what what have what are some changes you've made during those times uh, uh to make sure that the team stays afloat you're making money the team's making money everybody's on a good page uh what what are some major things you've done in those scenarios because last year a lot of people had bad uh with the interest rates super high there, there were a lot of issues but i'm curious to know what what are your thoughts when uh when market changes so i, I think you know a lot of people think that this is what success looks like, which is just a straight line up, right? But the reality of it is, success is a fucking EKG, you know what I mean? Sometimes you're on life support. So, you know, for me, like I feel like what worked two years ago didn't necessarily work last year, you know what I mean? So for me personally, my business, my personal business was up double, right? And I think the national average was down 20 to 30 percent. As a group, you know, we kind of flatlined a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that being said, we just had the best January we ever had. Right? I think I got paid on 20 some transactions, you know what I mean, from the group. So, but we also understood, you know, that there's a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline. Right. So, that being said, you know, some of the lead sources that we're using, like we might not have to change right now, but with a lot of the buyer agency coming down the chute, like we had to plan a little bit of a change and a little bit of transition. That is actually what led me to YSM, right? Like I understood that at some point my business is going to probably need to change instead of being buyer heavy, it needs to change to being seller heavy. So that was, I spent the last year figuring out, all right, how can I get more seller leads? Because that's where my business is going to have to go to. So that's where that evolution was. So, you know, last year for me was a little bit of a transition year. And, mm -hmm. you know, don't get me wrong, I'm still going to do my buyer leads, you know, through all, all my lead sources. But the reality of it is when the hammer comes down and we need to pivot or we need to change, and that mm -hmm. will happen, it's just, is it a year, is it two years or whatever it is, I'm going to be able to change pretty easily, right? Like, you know, I'll be able to shift because I've already put those things in place. I feel like a lot of the people that I know right now, their business is solely based on Zillow. I mean, what are they going to do in a year or two years when the the buyer stuff gets a lot more difficult? They're going to be scrambling where I've already been working on this stuff for a year or two years. Yeah, that's what I noticed too when we were doing a lot of buyer campaigns for clients. It's just so hard to convert. And the sellers are the, the transition, even though it's not everybody's cup of tea to convert a listing or the, the effort it takes to convert a listing, yeah, but think about think about what that really means, okay? The average buyer takes nine hours to convert, right? The average seller takes an hour, right? And you're usually making an appointment with that seller that works for you and them. If you're working for that buyer, they're wanting you to drop what you're doing and show them a house when it hits the market because they're worried there's going to be multiple offers, right? So 
One model lets you control your time and your schedule. The other one, you're on somebody else's time. Yep, yep, I agree. And also, it's uh, I've also noticed that for buyers, usually it's easier to have conversations initially up front. So there's not a lot of effort there initially. Uh, on the seller side, you have to put a lot of initial effort. And then once the listing, you have the listing, it makes your job a lot easier. So I I agree with you on that part. Uh, GR asked question, uh, do you believe solely in prospecting online leads? Or are you also guys doing cold calling? Does your team do any sort of cold calling? Um, what does that look like on your end? Well, so keep in mind, I have 14,000 people in my database right now. So, you know, there's not, as far as like cold calling, they can do it within the database. You know what I mean? All my leads are in a pond. If an agent has two hours, they literally can go right through the pond. You know yeah. what I mean? And call all that stuff or sort it out however they want to sort it out. So in my mind, those are probably a little warmer calls than say specifically cold calls. So that's how my agents are doing it. Got it. And have you uh, uh, worked with leads that are, you get from like title companies? Have you looked, have you done those type of leads at all ever or no? I have not. Okay. Got it. Makes sense. All right, guys, last questions. Uh, anyone? Well, I'll take one or two more questions. Okay. So okay. Billy has a question. Uh, is there a proven strategy to uh, to source FISBOs in order to gain listings? Uh, yes. You know, what, what does that look like, Tyler? Okay, so I do work FISBOs and expireds. Um, I use Vulcan 7, and I also have Red X. So in my opinion, if that's an avenue that you're going to go to, like that's where you need to go. Now I will tell you, you know, a, I feel like with the market shifting a little bit, like there's way more expireds and for sales that are up for play than there probably was the last several years. So where I think that was a tougher play, it's probably more in play now. But I will also tell you too, you know, it's a little bit of a longer play too. You know, I think if you want to work that for sale by owner and that expired, you know, those people are going to take five or six calls, you know what I mean, before you can meet with them. Right. I mean, if I had a dollar for every FISBO and expired, that's like, oh, my God, you're the 30th person to call me today. You know what I mean? Well, if only 30 people called you today, then that means half the realtors have already quit. You know what I mean? Because it used to be 60 people calling you a day. Um, but, you know, if I can make them laugh, if I can do something to have them remember me and then I can mail them something and then I can call them in a week, maybe another week, another month, another two months, like now you're you're building rapport without even knowing it. You know, my brother is a, a top realtor in Indianapolis. And he said that uh, they had a corporate meeting and the corporate um, sponsor said, if you don't plan on calling a FISBO or an expired at least six different times, you shouldn't even do it. Yeah. Okay. No, that, that makes sense. Uh, those are good. Actually bottom of the funnel leads. Uh, you know, it's just uh, people need to know how to work them. That's the biggest thing with those. Uh, last question: What source can we find uh, owners' phone number, uh, homeowners phone numbers for expired listings? Uh, you said Vulcan Seven. What was the other one? So uh, that... I can answer that a couple different ways, right? So Vulcan Seven is you know great. So I like personally like Vulcan Seven because the information drops into my Vulcan Seven every day. So every day there's an expired or a FISBO, like I see that every day. Red X, you have to search for it. Um, so it's a little more work, you know what I mean? Where Vulcan 7, it just drops in every day. And then the second part of that question is, I personally use Spokio, right? So like a lot of times with the FISBOs and the expireds, you get part of the information. Spokio is great. I can put in an address and it'll shoot out whatever it can find through all the databases. Like it'll give you some numbers, it'll give you email addresses or vice versa. If you have an email address, you can punch that in. If you have their name, you can punch that in. So I use Spokio personally to fill in the blank. Um, you know, it pieces some of my stuff together that uh, maybe you don't have all the information. That's what I that's what I personally use. Great, awesome. All right, guys. So I think we are uh, up with the time. Uh, put one in the chat to thank Tyler uh, if you found this helpful um, so that he knows. And then if you guys need... Uh, any one-on-one -on -one, uh, coaching or just to want to have a conversation, uh, Tyler does paid coaching as well. 
Uh, he can help you set up your systems, look into that as well. Uh, so you can grow continuously because uh, I think he has a great system on the follow-up side. So I'm going to put a, his email in the chat for you. Uh, so you guys have it. Um, I'll put it a couple of times, just make a copy of it. And then you can use that to reach out to him. Also, you'll get the Zoom recording as well of uh, this conversation uh, and also notes of all the software that he uses. Uh, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to write, uh, reach out to Tyler. I've put his email in the chat for you. Uh, reach out to him. And then if you have any other support questions, feel free, feel free to reach out to the support team. Hope that was helpful, guys. Tyler, any last words? No. You know, I would say I think um, it's easy to get frustrated, right? But the reality of it is, you know, you can never beat a guy that keeps getting up, right? And I feel like that's kind of what we do with our prospecting, right? You get knocked down. Somebody's mean to you. Somebody tells you to F off. You have a bad day. You lose a listing. You know, I think you just have to have, like, armadillo skin. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I, I allow myself to have a 30-second pity party. I can be, like, as upset as I want to be for 30 seconds, and then I got to focus on, like, all right, where's my next lead coming from? You know what I mean? And I sniff the boom of a stick and play my music a little louder and you know what, just focus on getting that next call. So, you know, I think you'd never let yourself get too high and you never let yourself get too low. Yeah. As a, I agree with you on that, right? Even as a business owner, when I run this company, it's stressful, but it's, it's always, you have to keep it going. You can't really stop it. So, and the best part in real estate, I know a lot of people may or may not agree with this, but the real estate market in general, like the ROI that you get on real estate leads isn't, you don't get with any other, type of solution. Let's say you are a dentist, right? You're selling like a couple of thousand dollar packages at the most. Real estate transactions, you can get 20, 30, 40K per transaction, which is the ROI is really high. Um, so in real estate, like you, if you guys have money, even one deal, take that entire money that you get from that one deal, put it towards your marketing. Uh, for the yes, and, I, and I think that's a good point, right? So like for me personally, like 30, 30 to 40% of all my money goes back into my business. Yeah. Yeah. Because the return is so high in general, right? We're, uh, like margins are high, return is high. So if you guys are making some money, definitely put that into marketing. It will double up. Like it will, it will quadruple sometimes too. So awesome. Tyler, that was great. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, helping everybody. I will send an email to everyone. Um, I'll also send you a calendar link. If anybody wants to have one-on-one -on -one conversation with Tyler, uh, see how we can help you guys, definitely do that. Uh, I'll put that into the, his calendar link uh, in the follow-up email. And then if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. All right. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Yep. See you, Ash.